morning. Each day is a gift from God. Each moment is that opportunity to reach out in service to God's creation. Each day is a reminder of the new covenant, not written on stone tablets easily broken, but inscribed on our hearts filled with joy and hope. As we come to the baptismal font and the Lord's table today, may we draw closer to God who has drawn close to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us worship God. Welcome to all of you who are here today for this Lord's Day worship, a special day in the life of our church as we come to the table and as also as we hear Andrea Castine's confession of faith in Jesus Christ and uh, participate in her baptism and then in the baptism of Adlin Joe, a wonderful day of celebration in our congregation. Please take time to look at the announcements in the bulletin, the things that are going on in the life of our church. Um, another community Lenten service on Thursday of this week at the United Methodist Church at 1205. We will have a Good Friday service on the 18th at 730, which will be including communion. And then our Easter celebration will be worship at 11 o'clock on Easter April 20th, two weeks from today. I have something I want to share with you. A couple of weeks ago, we finished our Logos program for this year. We finished about the third week of March as soccer and baseball seasons get underway and school is getting ready to be out. Um, and that last night, the, a lot of the kids made cards for different people. And I want to... This is a thank you, it says thank you Dr. Phil, <clears throat> but I want it to be a thank you to everyone who helped with Logos and to the congregation. And this is from a little boy named Jesse, who is not a member of our church, but comes to Logos. And it says, thank you Dr. Phil, he has a picture of me preaching. It says, I like your church family. Thank you, from Jesse. And that is a thank you to everybody who supports our Logos program in whatever way. But I want to tell you another story. I don't have the card with me. Well, he didn't make a card. We had a little boy that started coming just about six weeks before the program ended. A little boy about that big. I mean, it was just a little, maybe first grade, Jaquan. And the last night, Carol Steen gave out Academy Awards to all the youth and children. And Jaquan got a certificate and a trophy for best newcomer in Logos. And afterwards, he came up and he showed me his award and his certificate. And I said, do you know what that says? And he says, best newcomer. I said, do you know what that means? And he said, it means I'm the best. And then he said, I said, that's right. What does newcomer mean? And he said, it means I felt welcome here. That says it all. So thank you for everybody who helped with the Logos program. Let us worship God.
God of bread and wine. So pour out your spirit. Let the sacred waters flow. Fill us with holy food. May our hearts and our hands be open to our minds to receive your gifts of life. Amen. Our first hymn is number 492, Baptized in Water. Lord is good and forgiving. God is love and gracious to all who call upon him. Let us trust in God as we make the confessions of our hearts. I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Eternal and merciful God, you have loved us with a love beyond our understanding, and you have set us on paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We have strayed from your way. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, through what we have done and what we have left undone, and we have wandered from your pathway. As we remember the cleansing water of baptism, O oh God, we praise you and give you thanks that you forgive us yet again. Grant us now, we pray, the grace to die daily to sin and to rise daily to new life in Christ, who lives and reigns with you and in whose strong name we pray, amen. We are told that if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with Christ in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And so also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to all that is good in Christ Jesus. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. Please be seated.
Andrea Castine has made a request to the session to be baptized, and she has met with the session, and her request has been granted. And Zach and Andrea have made a request to present their daughter, Adlin Jo, for baptism. And the session joyfully granted that request. So at this time, I'd like to invite Andrea and Zach and Adeline Joe and Elder Kurt Simpson. Oh, Addy, it's okay. <laughs> and Elder Kurt Simpson representing the session to come stand with me by the baptismal font. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christian baptism marks the receiving of the Holy Spirit by all of God's people. And baptism with water represents not only a cleansing from sin, but a dying with Christ and a joyful rising with him to a new life. It commits all Christians to die each day to sin and to live for righteousness. In baptism, the church celebrates the renewal of the covenant with which God has bound his people to himself. By baptism, individuals are publicly received into the church to share in its life and in its ministry, and the church becomes responsible for their training and their support in Christian discipleship. Andrea, we rejoice with you as you publicly commit your life to Jesus Christ this morning. And when those baptized are infants, the congregation, as well as the parents, has a special obligation to nurture them in the Christian life, leading them to make a public profession and a personal response to the love of God shown in their baptism. And that is our hope and prayer for Adeline Joe. As we celebrate their baptisms, I invite you to remember and to renew your own baptisms today. <coughs> On behalf of the session, I present Andrea Lynn Bentley Casting to receive the sacrament of baptism. Andrea, through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. And within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. So, Andrea, as God embraces you in this covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. And I'll ask you these questions. Do you renounce all evil and powers in the world which defy God's righteousness and love, do you? Do you renounce the ways of sin that separate you from the love of God, do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love to your life's end, will you? And finally, will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, will you? Do we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Andrea by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Do we? If you're able, I invite you to stand and affirm with me our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. You see it's in a responsive form. It's printed in your bulletin, and I invite you to do that. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks for the countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might fulfill our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ. O Lord, uphold Andrea by your Holy Spirit. Give her the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of joy in your presence. Defend her, Lord, with your heavenly grace that she may continue as yours forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Andrea, Lynn, Bentley, Castine, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Andrea, child of the covenant, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Andrew, you've been received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church through baptism. And with joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ's church. Share with us in his ministry, for we are all one in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. On behalf of the session, I present Adeline Jo Castine, daughter of Zach and Andrea Castine, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Zach and Andrea, do you wish to have Adlin Joe baptized? Then I ask you these questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? Do you? Do you now unreservedly promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Adlin Joe an example? of the new life in Christ, do you? <laughs> and finally, do you promise to pray with and for her and to bring her up in the knowledge and love of God, do you? Do we, the members of this congregation, in the name of the whole Church of Jesus Christ, undertake with Zach and Andrea the Christian nurture of Addie so that in due time she may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, do we? Will we endeavor by our example and fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God? Will we? Let us pray. Ever living God, in your mercy, you promise to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you for receiving Adlin Joe by baptism. Lord, keep her always in your love. Guide her as she grows in faith. Protect her in all the dangers and temptations of life. Bring her to confess Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and to be his faithful disciple to her life's end. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Adeline Jo Castine, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Addie, child of the covenant, 
has been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Very special here. <laughs> Our two newest members, mom and daughter. And I charge you as a congregation to nurture both of them in their faith. Andrea, as she learns more and more, and Addie, as she comes to know all of us as her family. Andrea, this is a certificate of baptism for you. And this is a gift from the Presbyterian women, and it's the symbol of baptism, and it's the praying hand for you to remember. And this is the same for Addie, and I hope that you will tell her about this day many times. Yeah. Oh. Congratulations. God bless you. I'll stay up here. I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's sermon up here. been meeting up here a lot lately, talking about what water can do for us, how we drink it, and it makes us feel better, it keeps us alive, cleans us when we're dirty, and helps the plants grow and everything. But did y'all see what we did up here a minute ago? We baptized Addie, and you're used to seeing little babies being baptized, like when John Ward got baptized not too long ago, but you don't often see a big person get baptized here, do you? That's kind of different. I didn't hold Miss Andrea in my arms, did I? Like I do with a baby. I didn't carry her down the aisle. No, but it's very special. But it means the same thing. Miss Andrea made a promise today. She promised to be a follower of Jesus. And then her mom and daddy made the same promise that they would help raise Addie to believe in Jesus and to love him. And that one day, Addie can make that same promise on her own. So when you were baptized, promises were made. And did you hear? Everybody out there made promises too. And so when you come to Sunday school or when you come to Logos or when you come to Bible school or when you, even before you knew it, when you were a little baby in the nursery, there was somebody there to take care of you, somebody to fix your tacos on Wednesday night or teach your Bible story or help with the Christmas pageant or keep you in the nursery. And that's because people promised when they, you were baptized and when we baptized people that they would help raise you up and teach you about God. And it's not just for the little children like you, but it's for big people like Miss Andrea and all of us, how we all teach each other about the love of God. So we're glad all of you are part of the family of God, and we're glad Addie and Miss Andrea, her mama, are part of the family of God too. Let's have a prayer together. Thank you, Lord, for the family of God in this place. And thank you for welcoming us in baptism and giving us new life in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all the people who show your love in so many ways here to help us all come to know you better. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Just a moment ago, Dr. Phil charged everyone here in the room uh, with helping to raise Andrea and Adlin in the life of Christ. Um, I invite everyone to sing along on the chorus 
of, of this anthem, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Daddy was a preacher, she was his wife, just trying to make the world a little better, you know, shine a light. People started talking, just to hear their own voice. Those people tried to accuse my father, said he made the wrong choice. Though it might be painful, no, the time will always tell. Those people have long since gone. My father never failed. And even when the rain falls, and even when the flood starts rising, and even when the storm comes, I am washed by the water. And even when the rain falls, and even when the flood starts rising, when the storm comes, I am washed by the water, and even when the earth crumbles under my feet, and even when the ones I love turn around and crucify me, I won't ever ever let you down. For anyone who happens not to know, our guitarist was Grayson Castine, Zach's brother. Please pray with me our prayer for illumination as we get ready to hear God's word. It's printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. God of all wisdom and knowledge, in the reading and hearing of your word, help us know you more so that we may love you more. Help us love you more that we may serve you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our epistle lesson this morning is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read first from the English Standard Version and then again the same verses from the message. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy, mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing your, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And from the message. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Listen for God's word from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 12. This takes place on Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus has entered on Palm Sunday, gone back to Bethany, has come back on Monday and cleansed the temple and done some things, gone back. Now he's back, and this is where the story takes place, beginning in verse 13. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the word of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Perhaps you can explain the significance of the following scenario. I wrote today's sermon on Thursday afternoon. On Friday, I spent time trying to finish our federal and state income taxes. <laughs> and maybe that's why, as I was figuring out estimated taxes and looking at self-employment taxes and adjusted gross income and um, North Carolina D-500 with TC forms, I kept hearing Jesus' words in my head, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Somebody asked me the other day, when you picked out this sermon text, did you realize it would be right in the middle of tax season? Not really. And I thought today's sermon was going to be about responsible citizenship and our involvement as Presbyterians in the world around us. And I think you could probably get those ideas from Jesus' words to the Pharisees and the Herodians, but I think it would be a stretch. That's another sermon for another time. But I think the debate about whether it is lawful or not to pay taxes to the emperor from this story runs much deeper than whether or not we should file with the IRS by April 15th. Some of you got an email from me late Monday afternoon asking if anybody had a copy of Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus. One person responded and said, is this an April Fool's joke? And I said, no, it was a serious request. Because several people asked if I had read the book, and I had not yet read it. And as I was reading and started working on this sermon, I came across some articles about Bill O'Reilly's comments 
in various interviews about his book, and I decided I'd better read it for myself. In a March 2013 interview with Mark Lamont Hill on the O'Reilly Factor, Bill O'Reilly moved from talking about U.S. taxes to ask Mr. Hill this question. He said, I'm researching killing Jesus. Do you know why Jesus was killed by the Romans? And Mr. Hill declined to answer that question. Bill O'Reilly went on to say, you don't know and you shouldn't know because it was about taxes. In a September 2013 interview on the Today Show, Matt Lauer mentioned all the criticisms of the book, or some criticisms of the book, including the criticism that the of the idea that Jesus was killed because of taxes, and he asked Bill O'Reilly, what would you like for the headline to be? And his answer was, the headline is, Jesus died for money. That's what killed him. The Romans killed him for money. Well, I was really into it by now. I was reading these interviews. In the 17th chapter of his book, he, he describes the early morning trial of Jesus on Good Friday, and he writes this, Jesus has committed a grave offense. He interrupted the flow of funds from the temple to Rome when he flipped over the money changers' tables. The pipeline is the personal responsibility of Annas. Anyone interfering with the profit-taking must be punished. That, of course, includes Jesus and every single one of his disciples. Annas is determined that this will be a cautionary tale for anyone who considers challenging the authority of the temple courts. Now, my sermon is not a book review of Killing Jesus, but I'll be glad to talk to anybody who's interested in talking about the book. I have to say that his headline, that Jesus died for money, is a new one to me. Um, he references the story about Jesus and taxes, but he does so only to recount it as one of the many activities of Jesus on the Tuesday of Holy Week. And there's no question that on Monday when Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers, that added fuel to the fire of that volatile last week of his life. And after that story, Mark tells us in his gospel that when the chief priests and scribes heard the parable that Jesus had told against them after he had cleansed the temple, they kept looking for a way to kill him. But the controversy, the trap about paying taxes to the emperor is just one of many things that happened on Tuesday. And if you go through it, he had a really busy day. He went by the withered fig tree that he had cursed on Monday and his disciples said, tell us what's going on here, and he explained that to them. Then he had a dispute with the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who came and said, by what authority are you doing these things? which may mean just turning over the tables, but it may mean everything he's been doing. Then he tells a parable about a man who plants a vineyard and how the tenant farmers kill the, the, the servants and the owner's son, and it's against the religious leaders. Then they send some people to trap him with a question about taxes so they can find a way to get him arrested. Then they try to trap him with a question about the resurrection because they, they know some people believe in it and some people don't then somebody comes and asks him about the greatest commandment to that person's credit it seems to be a sincere question and then he talked or he watched people at the temple treasury he says he sat down and watched people come putting their money in the temple treasury and he had some teachings about that and then he talked to his disciples about the coming sacrilege of the temple the whole 13th chapter of mark is about that and mark 12:12 12, 12 says when they realized that he had told the parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. The trick question about paying taxes to the emperor is just that. It's a trick. It's a trap. It's a way to get Jesus to indict himself and to lose favor either with the crowds that have been following him or with the Roman authorities. I think you've I think you know what's going on here. If Jesus were to say, yes, pay the taxes to the emperor, well, the crowd would have been unhappy. They chafed under the tax burden of the foreign pagan occupying power. And to add insult to injury, they had to use coins with the picture of the Roman emperor on them, which was idolatrous. And not only that, but to make matters worse, inscribed on the coins at that time were the words, 
Tiberius Caesar, Emperor Caesar, or Emperor Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. It's blasphemous. It's idolatrous. On top of having to pay this tax. But if Jesus were to say, no, don't pay the taxes to the emperor, he could be accused of stirring up a rebellion against Rome. That had already happened when Jesus was about 10 years old. A tax rebellion occurred, and it was brutally crushed and put down by the Romans. There's no question that the Roman taxes were a burden for the people of Jesus' day. The poll tax, which was based on the census, was thought to be about one denarius, about a day's wages, which might not seem like much, but I bet if somebody asked you to give up a day's wages, you'd think twice. But it would have been a tremendous amount of money for people who were barely getting by, a subsistence existence. And it's not as if the people benefited from the taxes. I like to think when I pay my taxes, I'm getting fire protection or police protection or federal highways and other things, but these people didn't get those things. The money was taken from them and it was sent to Rome so the emperor could keep the masses happy and feed them while he spent money building these beautiful temples and these palaces to live in. Archaeologists have uncovered tax collector receipts from the first century A.D. I thought they were kind of interesting. It showed that the people had to pay Roman taxes on all sorts of things. There was a trade tax. There was a poll tax. There was a poll tax with additional charges. There was a poll tax for someone who died halfway through the year. There was a salt tax. There was a public baths tax. There was a basket tax. There was a beer tax. There was a company or property tax. There was a harvest tax paid in kind, which I guess meant you brought your produce in. Listen to this receipt that was found from the first century. It says, this is Pashinninter, I can't pronounce the name, Pashinninter, son of Petis, who says, I have been paid fully with the collection of the God for the year seven and with the collection of the God for the year eight of the exalted Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus. Pashinter, son of Petis, has written this. So there were taxes on everything. So how will Jesus answer this trick question, which he recognizes for what it really is? And his answer is probably one of the most quoted sentences of the Bible, given even by people who might not know where it comes from. Here it is in the King James Version, which maybe some people remember better. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. Mark tells us they were utterly amazed at him when he said this. But what does it mean? Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Does that mean we're supposed to pay taxes or not? Can you even take that story from Mark 12 and superimpose it upon our 21st century life as taxpayers in a democratic country and get any meaning out of it? Is the story for Mark 12 even really about paying taxes, despite what the Pharisees and the Herodians asked Jesus? I think maybe Jesus' ambiguous answer about giving what belongs to Caesar to Caesar and what belongs to God to God is meant to make all of us, first century Pharisees and Herodians and 21st century Presbyterians and other Christians and everybody, it's meant to help us or to make us decide what is most important in our lives. And once we make that decision, whatever the decision is, once we make the decision about what is most important in our lives, especially if we decide that God is the most important thing in our lives, then we have to always hold all of the other claims on our lives over against God's claim on us. One writer has said that the issues raised by this biblical passage are ones of allegiance. If God owns everything, then we belong to God alone. And yet we live a life 
in which competing powers and influences try to own us, to sway us, to capture our hearts. And we're called to live in wholehearted allegiance to God while navigating in life that often pulls at our allegiance. Now, taxes are on our minds this time of year. Be that as it may, Jesus' answer about Caesar's things and God's things, I think, has much more to do with where our ultimate loyalties lie than with what percentage we have to pay in taxes and for what purposes. I want you to think about what Wayne read from Romans 12, too, a few minutes ago, and I really appreciate how he read from two different translations. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God. I think most of the time we take that to mean don't be like the culture around you. But I think Paul's words are at the core of Jesus' answer to the Pharisees and the Herodians. What's most important in your life? And how does that shape and affect everything else you do? Jesus' response about Caesar and God does not mean, does not mean there is an equal balance sheet between the emperor and God. Well, the emperor gets this and God gets that, and it kind of comes out even. Because even Caesar and the things that are Caesar's ultimately belong to God. And the reality is, and I'm preaching to the choir, and all of you do, you know this, the reality is we live in a Caesar world as people who put their faith in the God who claims us in baptism and calls us to live according to the values of his kingdom. I'm not saying the world is evil and we need to escape it. I'm saying we live in a world in which things, good and bad, pull at us and demand our allegiances and our loyalties and our energies. And we do so as people of faith who claim to serve a God who has claimed us in baptism. So Jesus says, let me see one of those coins. Let me see it. Always interesting to me that somebody must have had one in his pocket. Oops, you know, what are you doing with that? Well, and he takes it and he says, whose head is this? Whose title is this? Well, it was Caesar's, of course, and Jesus knew that before he asked, but he had the people answer. And it's been suggested, and I think rightfully so, that Jesus was saying something like this. This coin was minted in the image of Caesar, and so it belongs to Caesar. But you have been made in the image of God, and you belong to God. Again and, and again and again, Jesus made his opponents and his followers think and come to their own conclusions. He very rarely gives a straight, direct answer, but he makes them think about it. And it's no different with us 2,000 years later. If you're looking in this story for a neat formula about how to pay taxes or whether to pay taxes or some kind of economic theory for our nation, you'll be sadly disappointed. That's not what it's about. Instead, Jesus' words to the Pharisees and to the Herodians mean that we will always have to decide in every instance in life what it means to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's we will need to decide every time what it means to live as the people of God in a world which puts many demands on our loyalties, our time, and our resources. Here's some interesting thoughts about Caesar and God and our Christian lives. In one sense, God has a total claim on our allegiance. There is nothing which does not belong to God. Nevertheless, society through its legitimate authorities also has a claim on our allegiance it can make demands on us and the words of Jesus remain our guiding principle we give to God what belongs to him we give to society what it has a right to ask of us and our cooperation in making it a place guided by the principles and values of God's kingdom 
To do anything less is to fail to give everything to God. Jesus had his run-in with some of the Pharisees and Herodians on Tuesday of what we call Holy Week, two days before the festival of the Passover. Isn't it interesting that our tax day, Tuesday, April 15th this year, is the first full day of this year's Jewish festival of the Passover and right in the middle of the week when we remember what God has done for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So even if you've already filed your 2013 taxes, take a minute on Tuesday, April 15th, and think about what Jesus said. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Take a minute to think about how we, people created in the image of God, can give God what rightfully belongs to him and that is our very selves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I selected a prayer from a church leader from the second century A.D., Anselm, that I thought summed up the message of this text. Let's pray together. Lord, because you have made me I owe you the whole of my love. Because you have redeemed me, I owe you the whole of myself. Because you have promised so much, I owe you all my being. Moreover, I owe you as much more love than myself as you are greater than I, for whom you once gave yourself and to whom you promised yourself. I pray you, Lord, make me taste by love what I taste by knowledge. Let me know by love what I know by understanding. I owe you more than my whole self, but I have no more. And by myself, I cannot render the whole of it to you. Draw me to you, Lord, in the fullness of love. I am wholly yours by creation. Make me all yours, too, in love. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings.
us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this sacred Lenten journey to the cross, you call us to share the love that you have so abundantly shown to us in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us remember that the earth is yours and all that is in it. Accept our humble offerings that we may be faithful stewards of the blessings you have entrusted to us through Christ. Amen. Our hymn of preparation for coming to the Lord's table is number 515. may be seated. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. <coughs> According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed and he broke it. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. Hear now the words of institution of this holy supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, after supper, our Lord took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. We're reminded that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With thanksgiving in our hearts, let us offer God our grateful praise. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe, you make for us a feast of rich food and well-aged wines. You will wipe away all tears and swallow up death forever. You are our God. We rejoice that you have come to save us. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels and prophets, apostles and martyrs, with the faithful of every time and place who sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. On the first day of the week, you raised Jesus from the dead. Death could not destroy him. The tomb could not hold him. Now he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit forever. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup, and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and with your church in all the world. Send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to show and tell the good news to all the world that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is risen from the dead. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry.
Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty.
us pray. God of glory, we give you thanks for this feast of your goodness and grace. Send us out to share the bread of life with all who hunger for your love. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 95. May the mercy of God ground us, the love of Christ take root in us, and the Holy Spirit grow in us, that we may be ready for the coming of God's kingdom. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.
foot. Don't have any doubt. All right, let her stand on your foot. Oh, I can see you now. Ready? All right, look here. A Eddie, Eddie. Woo! <laughs> okay, guys, we'll take another one at the house. All right, all right, all right. All right. Okay. One more trail. Oh, she Good. 